So welcome everyone to the fifth webinar in our um, webinar series for the Climate U project, which in full is Transforming Universities for a Changing Climate. It's fantastic to have you with us um, virtually, of course, and also welcome to any uh, audience members who are watching this after the event on the online live recording. So we have a really brilliant set of speakers with us today. Um, and before I introduce them, I just thought I would introduce myself and tell everyone a little bit about our project, if it's not already familiar to you. So my name is Dr. Charlotte Nussi, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at UCL at the Institute of Education, um, coming to you from a very warm London, unseasonably warm for September. Um, so a useful topic in hand to be considering climate change and the impact that it's having on all of us in both the developing and the developed world. Um, so the Climate U project is a partnership between five different universities in Brazil, Fiji, Kenya, Mozambique and UCL based in the UK. And the project has been running um, for about a year and a half now, we're about halfway through. Um, we're funded by the GCRF, the Global Challenges Research Fund, up until January 2023. And the focus of our study is really to consider the impact and the response um, and the contribution that universities can make to the kind of biggest challenge that we're facing at the moment, which is climate change, the climate crisis. We've had the IPCC report in, in August really recently, um, kind of uh, raising that code red for humanity. So this is an extremely timely contribution. Um, so we're thinking in the project more broadly about two different kind of dimensions for university responses to climate change. The first through this network of, of participating universities of the 12 universities in those um, four countries, as well as the university in the UK, is, is to really think about strengthening the systems, strengthening the responses of individual institutions and the higher education system as a whole in responding to climate change through the different dimensions and domains that universities work within. So that can be through research, through teaching, through curriculum and pedagogy, um, through outreach and extension and engagement with the community, um, through service delivery, um, or through campus operations and sustainability on campus. So there are all kinds of different dimensions to the university institution and systems that we're considering. And then the second is to generate a kind of deeper understanding, both in terms of reviewing the literature and also building theory around those possible contributions. And so this webinar today really speaks to, to the first and the second of those aims. First, by looking at the kind of Kenyan context as a kind of um, situation analysis of the kind of work and literature already happening, and then by offering some ways in which this contribution could be uh, furthered. So it's fantastic to have all three authors with us today. And I'm really, really, it's a great pleasure to be chairing um, this meeting. So we have Dr. Jacqueline Urere, um, Winnie Joy Gatwiri, and uh, Rachel Akinyi, all with us from uh, Kenyatta University in Nairobi, in Kenya. And we also have Professor Simon McGraw with us from the University of Nottingham, um, who uh, joins us as a respondent. So broadly, the structure of uh, the webinar today is that we'll have approximately 20 minutes for um, Dr. Jacqueline Herrera to present some of the key findings from uh, the webinar, from the working paper. Um, and then we'll have about 10 minutes for each of our respondents. And we very much hope that Dr. Missinger will be able to join us um, from the University of Zambia. We're just having some technical issues um, with getting him online and into the session. So without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Dr. Jacqueline Urere. Um, and if you have any questions that kind of come up for you during her presentation, please don't hesitate to put those into the chat um, that um, Winnie Joy and Rachel will be able to moderate. 
I've just seen fantastically that Dr. Masinja is with us, so I will promote you to panelist um, while Jacqueline gives us our presentation. So brilliant. It's really, really great that you're able to join us. And a huge relief to me that the technology hasn't failed us on this on this very warm day. <laughs> you can probably see that I'm feeling the temperature. Um, so let me hand over to you, uh, Dr. Nyerere, and we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charlie, for that presentation. I'm, uh, I'm happy to see everyone uh, uh, here today uh, participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, my presentation will be uh, brief, about 20 minutes. Please allow me to share my screen. Uh, okay. Are you able to see my screen? We are, thank you, Jackie, yes. very well. Uh, okay, thank you very much. I'm presenting on Kenya's climate change policy actions and the response of higher education. And uh, uh, it's out of interest that uh, um, uh, Kenya has had a number of policies that are addressing or that seek to address the impacts of climate change. And this paper, uh, looks at these policies, the policy uh, landscape, and looks at the in, uh, what the institutions are doing about the policies, the link between the national policies, uh, as well as the uh, institutional policies. Uh, it's co-authored by myself, Winjoy, and um, Rachel O'Kinney, uh, both of them are present here. Uh, the effects of climate change, uh, uh, in Kenya, like in many other parts of the world, uh, has been felt in a number of ways. Uh, we have felt uh, um, or we have experienced disasters like droughts, floods, rising temperatures, and um, result resultant diseases. And of course, Kenya being a country that relies on uh, sectors such as agriculture, tourism, uh, the impact is felt uh, more profoundly. And uh, if you can see some of the photos uh, uh, showing the kind of challenges that Kenya is facing out of uh, 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 the impacts of climate change, uh, you see the first photo uh, that is uh, showing Lake Baringo in 2020, the rising waters and uh, submerging property. Uh, and again, significantly this lake uh, is close to another that is uh, um, Lake Bogoria, which is uh, a, a lake that has uh, um, uh, uh, salty water and this is freshwater lake. And they're closing in uh, uh, as of uh, this year, the scientists sh show that they actually, they're closing in and we don't know what will happen when they actually uh, mix. And uh, you see photos of floods over the roads uh, during the flooding seasons. Uh, you see a national park, Nakuru National Park, that is submerged in water. But also, we do have uh, uh, these impacts felt also in tourism. Besides agriculture and other sectors, we do have this also felt in tourism. If you see the wilder mi migration for those who have uh, had a chance to visit our Masai Mara or the safari, as they popularly call it, uh, we do have the wilder beasts migrating from uh, Masai Mara in Kenya to Serengeti in Tanzania. Uh, periodically, uh, uh, and this, uh, are all, th this is also um, uh, organized through weather uh, patterns from both sides, but because of droughts, this has also been affected. So this, there are a range of impacts that have been felt uh, across the sectors out of the impacts of climate change. Uh, this paper seeks to illustrate the policy environment in Kenya, as I said, regarding uh, climate change and the link between these national policies and university policies, practice, and actions. So we, uh, the paper uh, seeks to highlight what institutions are doing regarding the policies that are already in place. Uh, the paper is guided by two questions. What are the national policies guiding mitigation and adaptation of climate change impacts in Kenya? And also, uh, what are the roles uh, that Kenyan universities are playing in raising awareness and enhancing their institutional and human resource capacity? This is informed by the fact that uh, studies have shown, and we do know that the role of universities are than creating uh, and disseminating knowledge, they do have a central role to play uh, in um, 
sensitizing, but also in uh, uh, bringing out information and knowledge that would contribute to uh, the response to climate change. We have studies that have highlighted the role of universities, a number of them, um, that could model a sustainable development and climate change through knowledge and production. So universities have this central role and with the impacts of climate change and the, uh, the, the issues that are arising out of that, then uh, universities have that key role to actually respond to some of these. Uh, we also have studies recognizing the need for universities to benefit from their relationship with communities through the adaptation of indigenous knowledges. So we were also interested in uh, looking at part of this, but for this study, we, we, we are more focused on looking at the policy, the policy landscape nation, nationally, regionally, but also at the institutional level. But we do see that uh, uh, studies also recommend adoption of issue-based curriculum as a way of ensuring that climate change is integrated, infused, and mainstreamed. And this, the strength, uh, this is the strength that we draw in this paper to want to look at what exactly are we then doing in Kenya related to this. But we've also seen that in other studies that, uh, that there are efforts, institutional uh, efforts uh, to integrate sustainable development, um, but uh, these have faced challenges. A lot of times we don't see this um, uh, link uh, between policies and the actual teaching strategies for sustainable development and adequate funding for research and development. So there are efforts and we are going to look at uh, some of the efforts that universities are putting in place, but we also know that they are facing challenges in terms of implementation uh, just a highlight of uh, what climate change landscape uh, looks like in Kenya. Uh, this, uh, we do have the uh, 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 constitution of Kenya 2010. Uh, it's um, a, a new constitution uh, uh, relatively. And in its article 43, it provides for the right to clean and healthy environment, which includes environmental protection. So definitely does not talk about climate change uh, uh, specifically, but it provides for, for, for that by providing the right to clean and healthy environment and other policies then draw uh, from this um, um, constitution of Kenya. Uh, one of the policies that also um, uh, came up in 2010 is the National Climate Change Response Strategy again, a key policy that advocates for communication, education, and awareness programs in climate change. Specifically within this policy, there's provision for climate change, uh, 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 but in the terms of implementation, it provides for this, uh, um, uh, the representation of climate change in curriculum uh, uh, development and implementation but it's not well represented. And a study that was done two years after its uh, implementation noticed that actually there was a gap in terms of what the policy was um, uh, proposing and what the actual school curriculum uh, uh, had. National Climate Change Action Plan uh, came in uh, in 2013 and it's, it emphasizes the need to mainstream climate change in all sectors of the economy, but it's very silent uh, on the role of universities, which actions, which, uh, which actions or uh, strategies should institutions put in place uh, regarding climate change. This is uh, a bit silent on that, but we have the Kenya National Adaptation Plan, uh, which specifically um, uh, provides uh, that, public agencies responsible for regulating university curricula advice on the integration of climate change into the university curricula. There's the central role that is played by the regulatory body. In this case, we have the Commission for University Education. And this, uh, because this is the body that accredits uh, uh, curricula, it has the power and has the authority to, be, uh, to, to direct uh, what goes into the curricula and to achieve or to ensure that institutions achieve implementation of, uh, of, 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 of peace. But again, uh, this hasn't been very pronounced. It hasn't uh, come out uh, very clearly in terms of the 
regulation through the uh, the, the, the central regula regulatory body. So six years down the line, we've not seen uh, this actually happening. But we also do have the National Climate Finance Policy 2016, which also requires that universities play a key role in research, capacity building, and establishment of centers of excellence on clean technologies. Again, uh, even though this policy requires that universities actually um, uh, play a key role in research, which obviously requires uh, resources. Uh, reading this or looking at this would uh, give a sense that actually there is already provision for funding for research. But uh, what happens is that this, uh, the climate fund itself is devolved. Uh, devolution comes in a way that uh, um, we do have 47 counties and the county governments have got some devolved functions which they take care of. But universities uh, or university education is not a devolved function, it falls under the national government. So there is that disconnect between what the policy requires of universities and the actual authority of this, because then the fund is devolved to the county governments, which are not responsible for universities. And now we see that challenge in terms of getting to fund research capacity building. Uh, and establishment of centers of excellence because funds from the counties will not go to fund the universities themselves. So again, that's the misalignment in terms of what is required of the policy and what the, uh, the strategies in place to ensure that that happens. So uh, we've seen that the policies uh, certainly recommend that universities uh, establish governance structures on university community engagement and the greening initiatives, but then there's little in, in, in literature to show this. Uh, there are efforts, as I said, and we've seen uh, some institutions uh, coming up with uh, efforts, but this is not uh, reflected in literature. Much of the literature that we reviewed, uh, we reviewed uh, papers between 1999 and uh, 2020, we do not see much of uh, the Southern literature. We do not see much of these efforts being reflected in the literature. So again, besides um, uh, uh, the policy or the weakness in policies in terms of uh, uh, guiding or providing proper guidance to the institutions uh, in relation to this, um, uh, the, the uh, climate change curriculum and actions, we again do not see um, a lot of the efforts that are already in place uh, in the literature. Uh, I, again, there's the weak link between the national and institutional policies. There's a very good uh, uh, institutional uh, landscape or national landscape uh, at sectoral levels. This was just a highlight. We have the, at the national level and sectoral level policies uh, requiring that uh, uh, different actors respond to uh, issues climate change but we do not see institutional policies themselves. So the institutional policies uh, are not very, um, uh, they, 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 are, they are not very refined in terms of uh, guiding Jacqueline, we just lost your sound. Um, please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, can you hear me now? We can, sorry about that. Yeah, I saw that uh, the host has muted me and I was not able to unmute myself, uh, sorry about that. So it is uh, uh, looking at the policies and 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 the, that weak link between what the uh, institutional uh, the national uh, level policies and the institutional policies. The institutional policies are almost non-existent. In uh, even the efforts that are happening in institutions, we don't see that institutional um, uh, policies uh, supporting the efforts that are happening. And we see that more um, leaning is towards sustainable development in general, and not specifically to uh, uh, not specifically to climate change. Sorry, I'm also not able to move my slides. Uh,
I'm not sure what the problem is there. The screen is hanging since the new thing. I don't know. Are you able to move? Are they the rights that I don't have anymore? No, you still have the right rights. There you okay. go. All right. So um, some of the efforts I, I mentioned that we see in institutions, this is not uh, uh, exhaustive, but we see that uh, there are institutional efforts. And one of them is the uh, uh, trying to move away from the um, uh, from, from the regular power to have the solar energy. Uh, this is uh, seen uh, as an effort of Strathmore University, which is a private university in Kenya and Kenyatta University. Uh, they have installed a number of panels to try to supplement the power uh, source. We also see that there are environmental causes uh, that include climate change. But these are within the schools of environment. These uh, in institutions that offer these are within the schools of environment. They are not common courses, meaning that many students are still not exposed to these. Uh, there are those that are offering these courses at undergraduate level, like the University of Nairobi, Kenyatta University. But there are those that also, um, sorry, undergraduate level is Catholic University and University of Eastern Africa Baraton and also those at uh, undergraduate and postgraduate levels, um, Kenyatta University and University of Nairobi. And again, these are concentrated um, uh, within the schools of environment, not to all uh, students. We have greening of campus buildings. We have Strathmore University here again, uh, University of Nairobi and Catholic University, which is a private uh, university. We have other efforts in other institutions like the Kenya Methodist University and University of Nairobi uh, engaged in organic farming and also um, uh, using this to um, sensitize or to capacity build the communities around them on this. We have uh, water bottle refilling stations at Kisi University, which is a public university uh, again uh, that has efforts. These are some of the efforts that we've seen, but we don't see a lot of this reflected in the literature. We also do not see the institutional policies uh, that are guiding uh, these particular efforts. So we've seen that um, some public universities engage in capacity building through provision of environmental related courses, but few have engaged in research activities or established centers of excellence uh, in this field. A number of uh, private universities have established centers of excellence uh, on clean technologies, but few have integrated these on climate change. So that's the divide we see between public and private universities. Um, uh, in Kenya, the number of private and public universities is almost an equal number. So we have uh, uh, very many uh, public uh, private universities as well. But we do see that clear divide in terms of uh, those who are engaged in curriculum and those who are engaged in the research and centers of excellence. Uh, there is low documentation uh, of these initiatives, but also there is lack of awareness of the existing legal and institutional policy framework. So at the institutional level, some of the um, uh, policies guiding uh, uh, curriculum and university operations uh, regarding climate change are uh, not um, quite known at the institutional level. And also there's the challenge of funding. Uh, yes, and um, we do acknowledge the uh, funding body with the Economic uh, and Social Research Council and also contributors who have uh, 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 given their input for the production of this paper. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nyerere, and thank you for um, bearing with us through the, the technical concerns. Um, Dr. Messenger has a few slides, um, but uh, we are not able to share those through um, the uh, attendee function. So Dr. Messenger, if you'd like to email those to me, then I'll be able to share those when we come to turn to you to give your presentation. 
Um, and while we sort that out in the background, um, I'd like to um, welcome um, with great pleasure Professor Simon McGrath, who's a member of our um, advisory uh, board um, and um, uh, uh, professor from the University of Nottingham, the School of Education. He's the UNESCO Chair in International Education and Development and an extraordinary professor in the Institute for Post-School Studies at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. It's a great pleasure to have him with us. He's a real expert on sustainable development, particularly in terms of post-school and vocational education and training. And we're really looking forward to um, any uh, insights that he has to share in response to Dr. Nureri's presentation. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Dr. McGrath, um, Professor McGrath, and um, please, as before, if you have any questions or comments, do share these in the chat. And we should still hopefully, despite the technical issues and late start, uh, have some time to have a discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Charlie. Uh, thanks and congratulations to, to Tristan on, on the birth of a new family member. I did see his name appear on the participants, but quite how he's uh, concentrating at the moment, we shall see. And particular thanks to, to Jacqueline, Rachel and, and, and Winnie Joy for a really important paper. And so thank, thank the three of you very much for that work. Um, Charlie was 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 overly kind about my expertise around sustainable development. I would say that I've come to this very late, um, and that it's you know an issue an issue of huge importance um, that we all need to be engaging with. Um, but let me bring some reflections from work the work I'm doing at the moment, particularly um, a couple of other GCRF projects, um, which. I, I, I'm working much more on vocational adult education, but there's lots of resonance. Um, as Jacqueline presented, you know, clearly there's a huge importance of these issues um, in Kenya and, of course, the, the other um, case countries and, and globally. Um, what Jacqueline said about national policies how environment policies and higher education policies uh, generally don't particularly well align, unfortunately, seems to be very common um, in uh, in settings we're working in. You know, South Africa is a country I know best, and you know, clear gap in these policies. But of course, even where those policies align, you know, what's lurking behind that is that the real powerful policy areas around around the economic and industrial portfolios of government and around the development agenda. And so even if environmental policies and higher education policies are talking the talk here, they're, they're constructed within a wider policy framework that makes it very difficult to see radical change around um, responses to the climate crisis. I just want to th really um, throw in three thoughts from from our work as say up more in adult and vocational spaces um a lot of what jacqueline presented particularly in that last slide showing you know what was going on in kisi and various other places um you know chimes with work um in the vocational space and uh shamal majumda who was the um the director of the unesco univox center to last year had done a lot of work around greening institutions and arguing that essentially you see five elements here. You see a greening a campus, and we saw some of that there. You know how we, um, water bottles was a good example in 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 that presentation, but also energy management, pollution management. You see a greening of curriculum, integrating environmental issues, and Jacqueline talked about some of that. You saw some, but actually very little engagement with the community around sustainable practices. Now, there are, is some really good work in, in sustainable development there. Um, in some places, um, I'm working, for instance, with Rhodes University in South Africa, who are doing a lot of work um, around environmental issues in the community, including around water. Um, of course, a little bit there about a green research agenda, but we have to be realistic. Jacqueline mentioned the funding challenge, and of course, 
the reality for for most African academics is that it's very difficult to do funded research, and so they're very limited in in what can be done. And then a green culture, you know, how do you start to think about changing the value set of an institution? And I want to come back to that in a minute. Now, the research we've done around vocational education training, I think, very much um, echoes what what Jacqueline's been saying. Pockets. You can see one institution that's doing well on one of these five pillars, but often only in one program. And she mentioned, you know, that the environmental sciences were often the places, unsurprisingly, where you were seeing most progress. So there's a challenge here of a deepening and broadening the 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 reach of of this set of programs. And this made me think also thinking from the uh, from an education and sustainable development space is how do we move from education for sustainable development to sustainable education and um stephen sterling who you know has been a big figure in higher education and sustainable development um kind of thinks has thought it out in this way and how do we move i say how do we move to a transformation as of course this project's talking about so how is something sustaining? So how are these university interventions helping sustain people, communities, ecosystems? How tenable are they? Is what that is being done ethically defensible? Is it working with integrity and justice? Is it respectful and inclusive? There's a danger sometimes in universities that they manage their own environments largely by excluding others. So. I'm sure many of you can, can have pictures of, say, institutions where um, there has been a tradition, for instance, of, of, of local farmers um, moving their animals on, onto university campuses. So, um, you know, the university can protect its environment by putting up better fences, but it's having a knock on effect into the community. Of course, we've got to think about how healthy these things are. You know, so ha what are the costs to staff and students in trying to make these environmental changes? You know, given we're in a seminar on Kenya, you know, I'm reminded of the experiences of Wangari Maathai and the and the you know the great cost that came with being an environmental ch uh, champion. And, and, and Sterling's fourth dimension is durability. Are these things working well enough as they're being introduced that people will sustain them? There's all that cost of doing the new, will it continue on? And then my, my third and, and, and final reflection actually comes from a seminar, uh, well, a, a conference paper that I was giving with South African colleagues this morning. And talking about the skills dimension. So whilst we're not saying that universities should be primarily vocational institutions, we know that in to a large extent they are vocational institutions. They're preparing people for future lives of which a large part is work and we're saying there's been a lot of thinking so far about greening initiatives but we increasingly need to think about the circular economy regenerative economies how do we think about not just reducing waste but turning to a situation where we've actually got a circular flow so waste becomes inputs to further things and how do we think about an economy that's much more regenerative that is thinking about the purpose of work in more radical ways is thinking about how that needs to fit into not just the economy of the market but the economy of the household the economy of the commons um and so thinking about you know those kind of notions about circularity and regeneration and how those need to be thought into when we're thinking about a sustainable approach to higher education so just just some thoughts but thank you so much for a, a really valuable paper thank you so much simon those those are really interesting uh, comments and reflections and it's really nice to see connections between different forms and and sites of work um i think one of the comments that you you raised around around values and around understanding um the extent to which 
university transformations is is sustained is really important for our project um, and I just wanted to, to mention um, the kind of different research dimensions that the project is engaging as well as the different actions so um, this presentation uh, from our colleagues in Kenya represents one of the um, literature reviews that we have we also have other literature reviews from the other three participating countries and then we in addition to that have um, uh, a survey which we're currently conducting assessing those very kinds of values that you're talking about in relation to students which is currently being rolled out in all four countries and then the final dimension to our work for those not familiar with the project is um, exploring locally generated initiatives through participatory research and so that's really aimed at sustaining change through building kind of active agents within university systems and engaging with community whatever those communities might be. So some really valuable questions and very much looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for those. Um, so without further ado, and um, very much in the hope that you um, will be able to talk, uh, Dr. Masinja, um, I've, I've just received an error message to say, Dr. Masinja, that the issue is that your Zoom is um, needing to be updated and that's why I'm not able to invite you for sound. Um, I don't know whether it's possible for you to update your Zoom um, while we have a bit of a discussion. We've had one question in the chat um, from Dr. Matuma, so we could discuss that and then come to your presentation. Rachel or Winnie Joy, please do read uh, Dr. Matuma's question. And then if one of the Kenyan panelists would like to answer it while I try to resolve the technical issues with Dr. Masinja. Okay, right, I can. Uh, Dr. Matuma is asking, with devolution, are there county specific policy interventions on the climate change? And how do this resonate with national government policies on climate change. Okay, thank you. Uh, Winnie, do you want to respond to that or I can uh, make a response? You can also contribute. Maybe just to briefly mention that, yes, that is true. There are some county specific policy interventions on climate change. And in that case, you find that, uh, for instance, the climate change fund is default, of which uh, that means that the, the county departments on environment have a chance of uh, implementing some of these policies that are national uh, founded, that those that are the, at the national level, they are devolved still at the county level. And so that's the link in the sense that uh, some of the interventions that are based at the national level are at some point devolved to the county level and the county government have the responsibilities of, of implementing those particular policies. But that's still unlike the university where that is not the case. Okay, uh, to add on to what Winijo is saying, uh, the, uh, one of the policies actually requires that uh, county governments mainstream uh, 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 climate change adaptation into county integrated development plans so they have um, an actual uh, responsibility through um, uh, integration of uh, 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 climate change adaptation into their integrated development plans. And a number of counties, I don't know if any, or any one of the counties is represented here, but we know that a number of the uh, number of counties have already um, uh, uh, developed their uh, county development plans and they have uh, integrated these, uh, uh, the climate change adaptation because it's a direct uh, uh, requirement of the national policies. So that's seen uh, through the, count, uh, the county climate change adaptation 
um, uh, or integrated development plans. So that, that, that's already happening. Not all counties have, but uh, some counties have already launched their uh, integrated development plans, including that. Thank you for those responses. Um, does anyone else have a question that they would like to ask? Please do you share those in the chat. Um, we hope that Dr. Masinja will be able to um, download a more recent version of Zoom to join the audio in the meantime. So I, I have a question um, for, for my colleagues, and I was wondering, are there any kind of um, settings that you think that the Kenyan case is particularly interesting to learn from? Um, are there any kind of contexts in which you think that the learning that came from this paper really applies to? Or do you think that the Kenyan case is so specific that, that it doesn't really have lesson, lessons to share with other contexts in similar regions or even elsewhere across, across uh, the global context? Um, if I can go, uh, I, I do feel that uh, there are lessons, uh, as Simon mentioned, as uh, some of the challenges that uh, we see and uh, uh, the context that we, we, we are in is not unique to Kenyans. Uh, we, we see that um, uh, there are efforts and uh, these efforts are drawn uh, partly from uh, uh, the global uh, policies and uh, what, the, what the government is implementing is partly uh, what is expected as, uh, uh, as a global response to, uh, to climate change. We feel that uh, the, the, uh, the efforts that uh, we see institutions making is something that uh, perhaps can be shared. Those are the, uh, uh, the efforts or the, uh, the practices and the engagements uh, between universities and communities, there are lessons that can be shared from there. But we also see that uh, there is that, um, uh, what we can also learn from the others is in terms of showcasing or uh, putting these uh, in the literature. We do not see the efforts in literature uh, th that is there. So when you read through uh, what's happening, you don't uh, or under uh, uh, matters climate change and universities uh, efforts, you don't see much out of the Kenyan uh, context yet their efforts. So perhaps it's, uh, it's, it's also um, uh, something that we can learn in terms of how then do we showcase, how do we uh, highlight, how do we disseminate information that is already happening. And we also uh, do see that uh, besides the policies, there are also uh, the uh, efforts even at the communities level that does not get to, uh, uh, to, to the universities. There's also that disconnect between not just the policies, national and institutional level policies, but also communities, community efforts and the institutional practices. Uh, I think those are some of the areas that uh, we can share and also learn from others in terms of uh, uh, responding to or institutional response to climate change. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, is there anything that you wanted to respond in relation to Professor McGrath's comments? Um, I thought the questions around how we conceptualize and enact transformation, for example, were really interesting, but I didn't know if there's anything um, that our author team would like to pick up in relation to his reflections. Um, not immediately. I, I feel that uh, uh, what Simon has, uh, has raised are really um, uh, part of the learnings that we can uh, we, we can have because as the, as the project launches, especially the uh, the, the PAR uh, processes, uh, some of what Simon uh, gives us is advice on how we can actually. Uh, uh, ensure that uh, institutions can respond and there can be transformations at the institutional level borrowing from what's happening um, elsewhere that's, uh, that's 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 what i see for now that uh, it is the advice that uh, would also enrich um, our project as we uh, as, as as we launch the especially the PAR uh, uh, 
practice and uh, efforts. Thank you. Uh, Winnie Joy, did you want to come in as well? Just uh, what uh, Dr. Jacqueline has just shared in regard to Simon's reflections, they were rich reflections. And uh, one thing that he mentioned in his reflections was about the cost of making these environmental changes. To what extent are we ready to probably, uh, to, to what extent uh, are we able to invest in, in making the environmental changes? To what cost in terms of the communities, the students and the people involved, the stakeholders. So that's a, a great reflection because even as we reflect on the policies at the national level, institutional level, then we also need to think of their in consequent impacts in, in, despite just the results that they're supposed to bring up upon in their implementation. So uh, that's something that probably we also, that provokes us to more reflections in terms of the policy costs in terms of the implementations. And in addition to that, there's an additional question on the chat. Maybe you can read it through. I was going to invite Rachel to read that for us. Good, and thank you. Initial response, but thank you, Winnie Joy. Um, so Rachel, over to you. Okay, I'll read, uh, try some questions. And the question reads, is marketization and commercialization in Kenyan higher education particularly the private stream within public institution, but also growth of more commercially oriented institutions, hampering universities response to climate change? Or are they allowing new income streams that might support university actions? Thank you, Rachel. I don't know if you have an immediate response to that one, or if you would like to hand over to your colleagues. Jacqueline or Winnie Joy, would you like to come in? Um, uh, let me give an attempt. It's um, uh, it's it's a it's a yes and no because uh, institutions uh, definitely yes, the marketization has seen a rise in the number of uh, private universities. I think we have slightly over fifty percent of universities in Kenya being uh, 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 private universities and uh, about forty seven percent public universities. But also within the public institutions, we do have uh, module two programs who are the uh, self-sponsored students. Uh, basically, they are private, uh, um, privately sponsored students within the public institutions. What we see, uh, the difference between the two is that in public institutions, they are trying to balance off the, uh, uh, their budgets. It's not uh, um, uh, what, what, what the institutions are indicating as part of their revenue generation it's offsetting the deficits uh, from government. So the government is not providing uh, as much resources as required. And so uh, the revenue generation through commercialization of, uh, of, 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 of uh, activities and also the programs themselves, it's going into offsetting the programs much more into the, uh, balancing the budgets rather than uh, uh, bringing on uh, or going into the um, uh, the area of addressing climate change. And for, pub, uh, for private universities, basically it's about profit making. Uh, we do not see the link, so far we do not see that link that uh, institutions uh, uh, raising income either privately or through um, uh, uh, private programs are using this funding to support um, uh, climate change efforts. But then there, there, there are funds that can be used for that effort, only that so far we've not seen that clear link. And for uh, public universities, essentially is more about uh, uh, offsetting the deficit that is uh, uh, in their budgets rather than addressing the effects of climate change. Thank you. Uh, Winnie, Joy and Rachel, I don't know if you would like to add anything. Okay, so I'm now going to um, invite Amanda Salvia, who is our colleague um, from uh, Brazil, from the University of Passafundu, who is one of our um, research associates, um, who has a question. Amanda, over to you. Hello. Thank you, Charlie. 
And thank you, especially to the Kenyan team, to Dr. Jacqueline, Winnie Joy, and Rachel for the great presentation and working paper. Uh, the, the reading and the presentation uh, was especially uh, nice as I could relate so much with the situation we have in Brazil because of the challenges of connecting the climate change policies and the role that we expect universities to have and their contribution to, to these uh, policies applications. So um, I, I am happy to, to say that, for, for example, in the project we have the PARs and the, this, this important role that they have in trying to address the, the challenges we, we, we see in our countries. So my question was exactly on this topic. If you expect that the PARs in Kenya uh, would be able to work on these challenges, uh, especially in terms of the connection between policies and the university contribution. And thank you again. <laughs> thank you, Amanda. Um, so who would like to respond to that? Please do you turn on your microphone. Um, OK, uh, thank you, Amanda, and uh, um, happy to see you. The PAR process uh, uh, may not entirely address the issues uh, to do with policies, but it does bring um, on board uh, different stakeholders, including the policy makers, the national county level uh, policy makers and uh, implementers, as well as the institutions and the communities. So we hope that partly perhaps there will be a contribution to get into discussion into discussions what's happening uh, what's the policy landscape at the national level what the institutions are doing and perhaps get to an understanding of how institutions therefore can be able to tap from the national policies and guidelines to uh, to, to match their own institutional policy what we see more uh, from uh, the PAR process is um, uh, getting the uh, participation of uh, stakeholders, a, a, a range of stakeholders, to get to address the university's um, uh, efforts uh, it, it through uh, the curriculum or the actions of the institutions themselves. So at that level, not uh, necessarily, uh, the, but we do hope that out of this, then perhaps we can influence, especially the institutional policy levels, and to bring that link uh, where the, 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 the link is weak by uh, bringing on board different stakeholders to, uh, to, to, uh, to a round table to discuss what is available out there and what institutions can do. That's how we see it. But as to whether it's going to address uh, entirely that um, a disconnect between the uh, national and uh, the institutional policy link, uh, uh, we, we hope in the long run, but uh, apparently for now we, concentrating on getting at least the stakeholders talking and uh, coming up with an intervention that brings on board all the uh, stakeholders. Just to add, just to add what Dr. Terry has mentioned, uh, for the interventions that the PAR will be implementing in the different universities in one way or another, though they may not address the gap that lies between the national and the university policies that address climate change in one way or another through the monitoring monitoring and evaluation of those particular interventions they will be able to to in one way or another generate knowledge that is going to build up uh, the development or enhancement of institutional policies on climate change in different that's different universities so in that case like she mentioned uh, we may not only be able to address the gap on the policies between national and the university policies on climate change, but in some great way could be able to contribute to development of institutional policies on the same through the knowledge generated through the PAR activities that the, that the projects will be working on. Thank you for that question, Amanda. Great. Uh, thank you both. Um, I'm, I'm sure that your uh, experience and, and activities will 
be a great way to, to uh, start off the discussions and um, impact in some way the policies. Uh, because uh, having the, the stakeholders coming together and, and discussing these things is already a great and important first step. So yeah, thank you again. And I, I'm happy to, to be partner of you, of the project, and we can collaborate throughout the, the next semesters. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm now going to invite Rachel to read the question um, from William Toomer, which is in the in the chat. OK, thank you, Charlie, for this opportunity. The questions read, what, in your opinion, might be hampering mainstreaming of climate change education in university curricula? OK, may I try to answer it? Please do. OK, when we talk of the university curricula, developing a university curricula sometimes is uh, considered to be a tedious process. It takes a longer time. And uh, maybe developing, mainstreaming the climate change education may, be, may take a longer process before it uh, actually it's actually implemented. And uh, again, maybe the institutional processes, the changes may also be longer than we expected. And maybe mainstreaming may, it may, may not have happened or may has not yet occurred maybe in earlier times. So coming out with it may be a little bit difficult. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Winnie Joy and Dr. Nuero, do you have anything you'd like to add? Just to support what Rachel has said that in our case, the development of a curriculum or any addition of information to a curriculum, for instance, if we went by having the integration of climate change uh, content in each and every multidisciplinary would take uh, quite a process because of the approvals at different stages. And so if that was the case, then it would it would not be feasible for us to do that within the project period. And even after the project period, it would also take quite a long time, which would again now not probably be able to, the impact should not be able to be experienced uh, in the near future. And so that again would be uh, an entrance to us going that direction on the curriculum. Um, just to add uh, um, on what Rachel and, 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 and Winnie have, have said, uh, my feel is that we, we, we just haven't had that push to uh, shake the institutions to turn around to that because we've uh, seen other areas where, for instance, if I can give um, an example of an entrepreneurship course, I think all universities have those courses either as uh, standalone uh, programs or as uh, courses uh, that, that are offered to all the students. Because at some point there was that uh, feeling that uh, in, uh, graduates should be uh, uh, enabled with skills, entrepreneurs skills, uh, uh, never mind the challenges of implementation and what the students get to learn when they are common courses and all that. But then there was that push that the institutions felt like this is the in thing is we have to address unemployment and issues of self-employment and we need to go there. So I feel that uh, climate change hasn't received that kind of, um, uh, of recognition yet. There is, there is talk about uh, climate change in the media here and there, and, but institutions themselves, they haven't felt that push because then uh, as, as much as the yes, curriculum uh, take long to roll out, to change and to add on uh, content, but if they start push, uh, which is now lacking and which we probably hope that uh, maybe when we start discussions with the PR process through projects like this and others, then institutions will begin to see the sense in, in, in that so that it's not just the environment. Because apparently when you talk about uh, issues to do with climate change, uh, you, you referred to the schools of environment, that's where it's supposed to be done. So that push to get the institutions to turn around to see that this is a problem that requires uh, a multiple stakeholder action, uh, that's where we, we, we are now. Not the space, not the 
time, but rather that push, that uh, uh, urgency, the sense of urgency by institutions to get to implement that in the curriculum. That's what I see. Thank you so much, Dr. Nyerere. Um, and just to just to share with uh, with colleagues interested, um, as part of the global reviews that we're doing, um, we've reviewed more than 80 articles around curriculum and pedagogy and integrating climate change into university curriculum and pedagogy, as well as relationships between universities and schools in terms of developing curricula as a kind of collaborative endeavor. Um, and so for those interested, that review will be coming out um, this uh, autumn um, to use the UK seasons. Um, so watch out for that if you're interested in curriculum and pedagogy. Our um, uh, principal investigator, Dr. Uh, Professor McCown, who's also on the call, um, is also written a working paper focused on these questions. Um, so more kind of work and thinking on these will, co will come through the project as we continue to develop. Um, I just wanted to raise some questions and comments, reflections from Dr. Masinja, who is in the chat. Unfortunately, the technology has meant that Dr. Masinja is not able to present his thoughts in person. Um, but what we'll try to do is to arrange um, a call with him and record his presentation so that will be uploaded in parallel um, to uh, this webinar on our website so you will be able to see his his thoughts at a later date so please do watch out for that um, on the events um, link on our website which um, Winnie Joy or Rachel please do share those links again in the chat. So Dr Masinja um, shared that his emphasis was on the last two sides on the issue of universities logging into the climate change debate and management processes in the country in terms of meeting their mandates as teaching research and society knowledge providers. So to be at the table as positive contributors, universities must be seen to be value adding by the other stakeholders. Universities must respond to the needs as identified by communities that are climate change vulnerable. Um, he also adds, um, the paper has shown three very important lessons, I think, from the practice that should be carried forward by universities. Universities should engage in studies that deliver opportunities of learning by doing. Um, so I don't know whether you have any responses um, from my Kenyan colleagues to those reflections and comments from Dr. Masinja. Just to thank her. Go ahead, Dr. Nyerere. No, you go ahead first. Just to thank Dr. Masija for the rich uh, reflections again that um, giving us, and, and, and again, this again adds more to even us being able to enrich this paper and being able to think through in terms of some of the outcomes of the paper and when 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 we look through some of the three important lessons that he points out uh, on and the universities engaging in studies that will deliver opportunities of learning by doing uh, that would be key especially in the university inter engagement with communities and also the lecturers and the students engagement in practical practices that would probably help in climate change mitigations within the university such as addressing issues on waste management within the university as well as other issues or other activities that surround uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation activities so thank you so much for that reflection and thank you because it also builds us or in in the knowledge on how we approach the intervention of our participatory action research activities that we anticipate to probably start implementing soon. And thank you so much because this again guides that. Yeah, uh, thank you, Winnie. As uh, uh, said, what I actually uh, wanted to say, I was speaking on uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Dr. Massinger's um, the comment that universities must be seen to be value adding to. Uh, by stakeholders and uh, we've seen this especially uh, during our meetings with the, 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 the stakeholders and uh, 
some interventions have been proposed uh, over the period, though we've, uh, we, we, we've not started implementing these. Uh, but we see that um, uh, communities and, of course, other stakeholders look up to the universities for this, and it's expected that being the knowledge producers, then there should be that uh, value addition from the institutions. But then, then um, the PAIs are structured in such a way, or they have been designed in such a way that we have all um, uh, stakeholders contributing equally to, 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 to that. But then uh, universities would take on the responsibility to, uh, to, 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 to take the central role in uh, uh, sharing this knowledge and uh, creating the knowledge around the interventions that will be required here. Thank you. Thank you um, to, to all colleagues for those really interesting comments. I thought I'd also direct um, the audience, if you haven't already seen, to Working Paper 3 in our series, uh, which has been published thanks to our Brazilian team, both in English and in Portuguese, uh, with webinars, the most recent two webinars, again, bilingually in English and Portuguese. Um, which sets out a kind of set of protocol and principles across the um, university teams of the five country study that we're working on um, for designing and thinking through participatory research um, exploring climate change by wow. universities. So if you haven't seen that already, that's a, a useful resource for um, any colleagues interested in these questions. Wow. Um, I'd just like to invite Professor McGrath to come back with any reflections, questions or comments uh, based on the discussions we've had so far. Thanks, Charlie, and, and thanks to everyone for a really valuable discussion. Let, let me come back on two or three things. I want to sort of, I think, clarify that when I'm talking about the, the costs of doing this, that it's not to say it's too costly, it's not that kind of far too easily rolled out oh well we can't do it because it costs too much but i want to focus really in what i'm saying by cost the cost to those individuals who are going beyond what is normally expected of them so i think um dr missingy's point about value added is a really important one but of course in adding extra value on one level there's extra costs potentially to staff of doing that so i think we need to think about how we make it in a sense low cost for staff to be more engaged in climate action and partly that's linked to making it thinking about the benefit system and kenya but all the countries we're thinking about including the uk have moved towards very performative bureaucratic ways of viewing staff and their worth to institutions and how people get uh, permanent roles and how they get promoted and so you know one of the questions then becomes for for q in the kenyan context as well as the universities is if this is important which of course it is how will for instance promotion um processes actually encourage these practices rather than in a sense penalizing people for doing the ethically correct things so i think there's a, you know a, a question in that space i think a very in, interesting other one that came up from the discussion was about the the decentralization to the county level and i think obviously the kenyan policy to have a university in every county from a few years ago did put significant burdens on the system in terms of how many staff with phds were were required relative to um the capacity of the system to produce them and clearly the, the policy did not add up in terms of we're going to move we're going to make make sure there are a university in every county everyone to, to be a lecturer has to meet these qualifications but we can't even produce 10 percent of those people so there were problems there around decentralization generally but i think generally the uh, you know the cl the classic environmental adage about you know thinking globally and acting locally we we clearly need degrees of local diversification and subsidiarity in a sense that institutions can do things 
at the local level with local communities and thinking who the stakeholders are around universities is really important but how that also collaborates and how we get people learning across the system so someone's doing something really interesting in you know in Masai Mara or in Kisi how do the people over in Mombasa for instance get to hear about these interesting interventions from the other side of the country so i think there are you know important things about learning across the system i think that's enough for me thank you simon that's really interesting because it really ties into um particularly the experience from our colleagues in fiji um who've been talking about the normal kind of relationship between universities within fiji is one of competitiveness but actually within this project they're kind of thinking through what it means to collaborate rather than to compete and kind of within that value-added neoliberal system of, of what universities are designed to do and to be the kind of ways to trouble that and, and to work differently I think are are really posing challenges but also very interesting kind of opportunities um, for all of our different um, contexts. Um, Jacqueline, Winnie, Joy and Rachel, would you would you like to um, respond to any of those questions or comments from Professor McGrath? For me, I, I just thank him for the clarification, but uh, for the input that he has given us and also for the reflections that he has provided us with, no, nothing much to share right now. Um, I thank you very much, Simon. I, 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 your last comment reminds me of the, the, the way we uh, do things more in a silo where uh, each institution is doing uh, 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 different things, but then the, the rest of the institutions do not get to know about that. I think it's a, a something that we need to pick up so that even through the project and uh, the lessons that we pick from the project, then we are able to uh, right now, there are three universities participating in this project in Kenya, Kenyatta University, Kisi University, and Kenya Methodist University. But we would like to, uh, to, to find a way of sharing this beyond the, the, the institutions, the lessons, and also the activities that we're involved in to share uh, beyond that. So it's also a, a problem. And as, as, as you mentioned, yeah, it's true uh, that, uh, for instance, um, in Kenya in, uh, from 2018, we were required to have only PhD holders teaching in universities. And then there is the ballooning of uh, universities. The training of PhDs does not, uh, uh, it's not as fast as the growth of the institutions themselves. So on the one hand, there's a requirement that we need to have the PhDs, for instance. But then on the other, institutions are growing beyond the capacity of institutions to even produce the, those many PhDs. The issue of um, having different uh, or institutions in every county has not even been realized, even with the growth, the rapid growth of the institutions, it, has, it hasn't been realized yet. And these are all uh, things that are, that are happening for real, but most important is how then do we get to share the lessons, the learnings uh, across uh, different institutions so that we don't uh, get to have or to keep the knowledge that is acquired uh, within particular institutions and not shared out with the others. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Rachel, do you have anything you would like to add or? Oh, just to thank him for the reflections that uh, he has given and uh, the clarifications he made, I think to add. Thank you. Um, Simon's just shared another comment um, saying, I wonder what CUE can do. For instance, Nottingham are working with the Zimbabwe Council for Higher Education on some policy issues and are about to have a workshop with all VCs and registrars. Um, and so I think, again, around that idea of connection, um, are there more kind of um, uh, ways to build connections within the system between institutions um, and within them themselves? Uh, yes, the Commission for University Education has the authority uh, to regulate uh, institutions and actually if, uh, if, if the Commission, for instance, decided that uh, university curricula should reflect this, then it means that curricula going through the 
uh, the Commission for University Education then should reflect that. I think that's what happened with the entrepreneurship programs. If that also happens for the climate change, and it's possible to do that because then they have that uh, authority to be able to regulate um, uh, in institutions. Of course, institutions develop their own curriculum, but if some components are required of the institutions in the curriculum, they present to the Commission for University Education. I think that's the easier uh, route that uh, then these are some of the features that they, because they do direct uh, uh, how the curriculum should be presented, the content and, and, and the flow and all these, if that is also part of the requirement, then the Commission for University Education is able to uh, to do that across uh, public and private universities. Thank you. Um, so we have just one minute left. Um, I've just shared in the chat that if you haven't already heard that it's possible to become an affiliate researcher or an affiliate institution um, on that theme of making connections within the system, please do consider getting in touch um, through the website or by emailing me directly um, and Professor McCowan. Um, and we have a growing set of affiliating uh, universities, um, particularly from Pakistan and India, but also from from some other settings, including um, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, Tanzania, um, and other contexts as well in the UK. Um, so it's been a real pleasure and an absolute honour to be the chair of this session. And thank you everyone for bearing with us and for having such a rich um, and informative discussion, both that will kind of feed into our conceptual as well as our practical thinking. Um, the next webinar in the series will focus on the Brazilian literature review, so we're really looking forward to um, publishing that very soon in the upcoming weeks, and we'll share details with all colleagues um, about when that um, upcoming webinar will be, so please do follow us on Twitter or through the website for updates if you haven't already. Um, and just again to thank our panellists, both in presence and unable to speak, Dr. Masinja, you made excellent contributions to this webinar, um, despite the technical issues, and we really appreciate you staying with us and being involved in the discussion, and we really hope that we'll be able to record your comments um, so that they can be on uh, the, the website for um, online viewing at a later date. Um, but particularly thank you to um, Dr. Nureri, to Winnie Joy and to Rachel um, for such an excellent paper and such an excellent presentation and for such um, fantastic reflections and, and a conversation across the teams, both within the project and within the audience. So thank you everyone. Um, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar um, and we're really looking forward to engaging with you again soon. Um, so I hope that you all have excellent days wherever you are um, in terms of of the time zone um, and we'll we'll be in touch again and um, to let you know about upcoming events bye bye for now and see you all soon